this, this chair right here. They should be. Sure, what happened here? <laughs> oh, now, okay, there we go. It, it went to sleep. Uh, so she's she's gonna have to log in again. If, yeah. Okay. Yeah. to each other we're almost best friends but we've never seen each other <laughs> is that right practically right <laughs> has everybody got slides is everybody uh... yes everything is set up so we we make one big presentation yeah um which is why i don't know what's going on with my computer oh, it's good doing that actually mine does that as well because mm -hmm. mine's old okay everything is very small oh, yeah, everything's extremely small yeah it's bigger on there actually. You can see it on the big screen behind ah, me okay. if it helps. 
if you extend the desktop, you will get your resolution back on your monitor. If I what? If you extend the desktop. How do I do that? Uh, let's go to... Can you show me your wings? It's not mirror. There we go. Awesome. It is, but now it's. Oh, now so it's, you make it. Now yeah. So, you so drag we, it over. we just need to make sure if it's in presentation mode, it'll automatically go to that guy. Okay. Uh, but if not, just need to make sure. Okay. Thank you. All right, everybody, thank you for being here and there, whoever is streaming. Um, this is uh, our Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous, which we host once a month. And we're one of the first few that started this, connected to the Leonardo Society that was formed by Frank Molina in 1969, actually, and ended up being a journal that's really the first journal and the most important one for art and science collaborations and writings. Um, now, I think 12 years later, there's 50 
places around the world who host these lasers, which is really an amazing moment if you think about it, how much is spread and how much people are realizing that in this time of crisis, we actually have to bring these worlds together. So we have a presentation of five people. Each will talk for about five to seven minutes to kind of create a, a place for you to take on further discussion. And many collaborations have emerged from these meetings. So the idea is to make it more social, less luxury type, and I will keep it short myself. Um, the first person who will be talking is Nina Weisman, who we know well, and uh, she's here in LA. She co-created and directs the Laboratory of Embodied Intelligence, or LEI, and this is a collective that's dedicated to exploring the role of embodiment in forming non-human intelligences, which is so important right now. And this ranges from microbiomes to animal relationships and extraterrestrial uh, beings. Um, she comes with a degree in Harvard, Center College of Art and Design, and has taught in many institutions. So please give her a warm welcome. So thank you all. Um, thank you so much, Victoria, for the invitation. There you are. <laughs> uh, let's see. We're here. Am I up? Just down. Oh, you're doing on the bottom? Yeah. Yeah. OK, cool. That's you. That's me. Oh, I see. I just. <laughs> can I just use the next? It's a little different. Anyway, I'll see if that works. All right, so I'm going to talk about physical thinking um, and the ways in which movements and postures play a fundamental role in shaping thought. Um, I, I'm showing here just a number of a little images from a lot of interactive sound installations and performances that I've created. Uh, I won't be talking about most of those, but I just wanted you to know this work comes out of like a long history of working with uh, movement, sometimes encouraging audiences to move through pieces, mostly that, and then more recently uh, building performances. So uh, to get into embodiment, I want to bring up Rodolfo Linus, um, oh, who was the, was the chair of neuroscience. You. Um, and he talks about, uh, he's done some very interesting research that shows um, that movement is really fundamental in shaping uh, our ways of thinking. And it works like this anything you've learned to do, walking, typing, brushing your teeth, um, he calls these motor patterns, but these patterns are recorded in the basal ganglia. And these motor tapes or motor patterns play in your brain all the time. Not all of them at once, but at a given moment, one or well, two or more might overlap. And you can imagine it's like, well, if you see the world just through this, it looks this way. If you see it through this, it looks this way. But when you overlap them, you're going to see something different. And this is how these motor patterns work in your body. So this interference between um, learned motor patterns in your body can create new logics so movement is very important. Uh, another person who brings up the importance of movement and, and gesture uh, is Ramachandran, V.S. Ramachandran at UCSD. Um, and he talks about the brain structure itself, the angular gyrus, a uh, uh, little a structure that connects the center for visual um, sensing, uh, sonic, uh, auditory sensing, and for proprioception, your sense of where your body is in the space. So this one sort of triangular form shuttles information between these three sensory regions. And so de facto abstracting these patterns from one to another. I don't have time here, but there's a cute little pattern test that it doesn't matter what language you speak, everybody will easily conflate uh, words, sounds, shapes and movements. Um, so he, he feels that this convergence of different sense modalities um, and the abstraction that comes from that is the, what allows us to do all the abstract thinking we do, and in particular is the basis for language. So here again is movement in a very important role, along with visual pattern and sonic pattern, which generally get more attention. Um, so let me hop over to uh, this little, just a quick look at an old early work called Training that I did. Um, 
Let's see here, any volume here? Nope. All right. So um, I'll just use this piece to talk also about mirroring, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, but it works also for simply hearing. I think a lot of us know these tests have been done with monkeys. If one monkey sees another one crack nuts, the same neurons fire in that monkey's brain as if it were cracking nuts, and the same muscles are primed to act. We don't know precisely how it works in humans, but we, we do see uh, the effects of it very clearly. Um, and it works also with monkeys and with humans by simply hearing the sound of another creature moving. Your same muscles will be primed to act, uh, the nerves fire, so you are subconsciously enacting that same thing, which allows you to, it's a survival thing, you know if you're about to be attacked, but it's also the tool for learning and for empathy. So, I did that first little test um, where I'm walking to uh, being sort of trained by the sounds of film noir footsteps and I showed these videos very large and they would sort of lead people to actually start walking in the same way. Um, I don't have time to run through those now but um, they were sort of a, a test, a simpler test to lead to this interactive piece, displacement. So here you see his body is tuned uh, by the sound, and most people who walk through, whether they know the origin of the sound or not, they'll sort of pop with those lighter sounds in the beginning, and by the end they're marching in this very regular kind of military way. And in fact, the original sounds are women walking in high heels, and then I morphed the sound in between, uh, and, and at the other end we have uh, 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 marching boots, uh, military campaigns. So, um, and it was, uh, it had a lot of different kinds of impact on people, but it was again this study in how uh, sound can influence logic. Um, this is, well, sorry, I'm gonna jump through that. We're not gonna look at this today. Um, so the Laboratory for Embodied Intelligences, um, as Victoria brought up, um, I'll, I'll just give you a little warm up for that. Um, uh, one last bit of theory on embodiment, uh, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, who some of you may know, um, uh, have written that the structure of reason itself comes from the details of our embodiment. So the, the, very, the same um, neural and muscular pathways that we've developed in order to move in the world, to sense in the world, our rational, so-called rational thinking, which is not rational at all, runs on those same paths. It is fundamentally embodied, so there, there is no rational thinking. Um, if the structure of our reason is created by the same mechanisms as our perceptions and movements, and those mechanisms have evolved from microbial behavior, then looking more carefully at microbial behaviors may reveal connections between our logic and those of other species on the Earth. And this is work that I developed while I worked with scientists up at the SETI Institute and NASA, who were very interested in this idea of embodiment as a way to, uh, say, walk a mile in the shoes of a microbe, to get a different perspective on what that worldview might be. Um, and you can see here, like, the um, incredible inventiveness of uh, both in form, uh, architecture, um, social decisions that are being made there. Um, Lori Marino, another neuroscientist, has found that all mobile unicellular organisms pe possess the fundamental characteristics of nervous systems. So perhaps our modes of perception, communication, and movement are simply elaborations of those that we inherited from our tiny ancestors. That's quite a lot of common ground on which to build understanding between humans, microbes, and everything in between. So with this in mind, I created the Laboratory for Embodied Intelligences, inviting um, the choreographer Flora Wiegman to start with me in the early phase to develop movement. Uh, I invited scientists from NASA, SETI Institute, U, uh, USC, et cetera, and combined them with uh, experts in physical thinking, movers, artists, et cetera, to, to develop new ways of moving. So here we see um, 
And the sound is not so important here. This was a performance. Oh, well, all right. I'm going to bring it down just a little if I can. I cannot. All right. Um, so here these movements are based on microbes are able to build appendages, peely they're called. Um, many of them can grow them anywhere on their bodies. And so this allows a kind of 360 degrees of movement that we don't have. They also use them to stick to each other and move as a cluster. So that's what you're seeing here, this kind of tuning in and, and sticking, literally connection to the bodies nearby to move with them. So in doing this, the dancers, uh, there's a kind of reading of bodies and an empathy that needs to be developed for this to happen. Um, and people who watched it also felt that some of this was being impressed on their own bodies. Um, microbes have also exquisitely sensitive cell membrane that responds to the slightest change in the electrical field. So we worked on, we humans have a thousand nerves per square inch and we don't usually tune into them, but we work together to turn into those so that they could also um, respond to each other based on heat and electrical impulse in ways they hadn't before. Um, Microbes also use their appendages to exchange genetic information. They can, give, one microbe could give another one the ability to run, to move individually that it didn't have before. So we experimented with these kinds of processes too. We were wondering if we could perhaps, by learning this incredible sensitivity and these social decision making that's going on here, um, if we might expand our sense of perception and empathy with each other by training our bodies to move and sense in the ways that they do. Experts in astrobiology also feel that microbes will be the most likely form of life we find out in space. And so this is the extraterrestrial connection that we're talking about here. Um, if we're going to meet microbes, it seems like a good idea to study those we have on Earth to get some sense, maybe, of how they might communicate, how they sense each other, how they make decisions. I only can show a little here, but there are a lot of um, work we did on decision-making processes also. Um, so a very quick look at some recent work, uh, just like, yeah, okay. Um, this is called Internatural One, and this is a piece that I worked on, um, do I, yes, well, up at Mono Lake with scientists from the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Lab. And here I brought dancers up and this opera singer and we focused on um, sort of key creatures in this primordial environment of Mono Lake, which is like early Earth and it's also like Mars. So it seemed a good location to sort of get in, dig in, study the movements of the key characters there, certain microbes, flies, gulls, uh, the water, the tufa, and, and as a way to understand these creatures have lasted for so long, how might they have done this? Um, what can we learn from the way they move and do things? So the piece was positioned that these are a group of aliens, a small group who have arrived, and where they come from, the way to learn about something is to synchronize with its rhythms and behaviors, to let it tune them from the inside out. So that's what you see them doing. So here, they're learning movements from the alkali flies and some of the social patterns. And some of it is, right, well, there's a whole range I'm not showing you. Some of it's very lovely and sophisticated and some of it is quite silly as humans are also. It was a 25 minute performance, so if you sit with it, you can start to observe the metaphors or parallels between how we behave and how they behave. Uh, there's a little bird bit. Here they're moving. Uh, the, this is some of the communication language that the birds use up there. And this is uh, just a little bit where he's been influenced by digital presences there, just to hint at what happens when you don't follow natural rhythms. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. So we go through some of your other slides. <laughs> so Rochelle Gribble is, Gribble is next, sorry. Um, She's also an artist based here in Los Angeles, and we're happy to have her for the first time here. Actually, Ellie introduced us. Um, 
Ellie is a DMA graduate arts alumni. Happy to see you here. <laughs> so Richelle is a founder of Super Collider, which is a science art gallery here, and it's a platform as well. She had many solo shows, um, some of them in New York, and also an international orbit around Earth, etched on satellites and abroad rockets. Um, I like the way she defines her work as exploring connectivity in a world where human impact, technology, and the environment collide. Please welcome Rochelle. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I brought some information about Super Collider if you want to take some postcards when you finish up. So my background, I'm really interested, uh, like Victoria was saying, in interconnectivity and the ways that systems connect. This is really inspired by Frank White's uh, discovery of the overview effect, which the overview effect is this experience when in spaceflight and viewing Earth for the first time. Um, he interviewed dozens and dozens of astronauts about uh, that sensation of seeing Earth from above and realizing that it's one living system. Um, and one body. Borders are disappearing and it's uh, alive and thriving. So this interest in looking at global connectivity has inspired me to travel the globe. <laughs> so I do a lot of different artist in residence programs. I actually just returned from uh, the Arctic Circle where I was actually interacting with the environment in a series of video performances doing ice clearings, showing human impact on climate and the environment. Um, so this is just another thing that I was experimenting with, taking remains of a glacier, which is receding behind me, and actually creating cyanotypes with the sun exposure of these chunks of glaciers, really showing this trace and this remnants of uh, a history that's that's passing and this is in the moraine level of the glacial terrain which is essentially the graveyard of where the glacier once was existing so I'm inspired by this idea of global connection uh, this is a large-scale painting that I created where the centerpiece is a symbol of uh, the internet and then we have bacteria and zeros and ones being the origin of code and the origin of life and then on the sides, we have water and carbon, which makes life on Earth livable. Um, and then it explodes into this connected structure showcasing biology, technology, and social networks. Um, so this was a recent show that I had at uh, Jonathan Ferreira Gallery in New Orleans. And the show was entitled Anthropocene, uh, looking at the geological age that we currently exist in um, seeing how humans are having a direct impact on climate and the environment. And so this showed both artworks that are looking at Earth without human impact, so a lot of living systems and how they're entangled in a vast web of life, uh, to also kind of zooming out and looking at how humans self-organize uh, and how do humans reshape the planet with urbanization and uh, different structures. So there's a trail of eco footprints going through. So people were traveling and retracing the steps of their impact. Uh, and this series is inspired by the pale blue dot. So here is a sample of organized chaos where I developed these at Planet Labs, which is a satellite company in San Francisco, and they host a residency. So I got to use all of their satellite imagery to recreate uh, migrations from an aerial perspective, as well as cityscapes and parking lots in the ways that, the, the crazy ways that humans organize ourselves. Uh, this is also along those lines of looking at these systems and how they're linked and connected. And uh, this is a, a larger piece um, that also brings in space elements. So we're going to get there and talk about space. <clears throat> uh, this piece is relatively simple, but I think it really shows what my work is about. Um, this is a real spider web that I collected when I was at a residency in Japan. And I came home and started to compare it to city maps and realized that they have very similar structural properties. 
And I think this, this piece, what I really want to remind people is that we're a single strand in this vast web of life and that we're also replicating it um, in many ways. So these reminders that we're, we're not separate from our web of life. This is another sample of a series that was inspired by the satellite images at this um, satellite company and was created using traditional uh, Japanese paper making techniques at the Awagami factory. So here, all of the fibers in Kozo pulp was collected and harvested along the rivers and deltas where I was painting. So the idea was to really paint the land made from the land. Um, here we have Web of Life, which was another show where it's looking at systems thinking, uh, how can we build a more holistic worldview and realize that, you know, the dolphins are actually impacted by the freeways because of water runoff. So I'm really interested in showing those relationships between things that people don't always realize. And then that also forced me to weave a web of life. Since I was exploring webs, I taught myself how to weave and uh, was upcycling a lot of different materials. Uh, this was a project where I'm exploring different networks and systems and then enabling people to build their own connections uh, with this movable puzzle installation. This was also converted into a computer game so people could build their own visual networks and then share to their social networks. All right, now we're gonna talk about space. Um, so I have a huge interest in space and um, I've actually had a few opportunities to work directly with several space companies, uh, making artwork for Blue Origin and launching it aboard the New Shepard space flight in 2015. Um, it just went up and back, but it was that idea of sending a message to space and what would you say and what does that represent. For me, DNA is what represents all living systems, so then also having a community build a ladder to the stars seemed like an appropriate way of representing how we got to space. And then it's accompanied with a certificate of space flight. Um, and this is actually going to be traveling to the Matsudo International um, Art Festival happening next week in Tokyo. And the idea is to have this along with other space art objects that have traveled to, to outer space or are made for space. Uh, this is a piece that I created a large scale 8 foot by 18 foot painting uh, really looking at the global connectivity of all systems which is now housed in Relativity Space which is a 3D printed rocket company uh, based in Inglewood. So that idea of putting art objects around the people that are shaping our futures is very exciting for me and actually being able to contribute to their imagination and inspiration is really where I like to get my artwork. Uh, this is a satellite that I was invited to create an illustration for that would be etched onto the side panels. I actually have four satellites that I illustrated artwork onto that have been launched to space. <laughs> um, so these are the Dove satellites and they're launched out there without their wings suspended. And then as they're launched, then the wings come down and that's when the artwork is revealed. Luckily, there was an astronaut in the ISS who could take a photograph of the launching process. But the art wasn't shown yet. <laughs> I was like, darn it. <laughs> Beggars can't be choosers with that. Um, OK, so this is a little bit of information about the Matsudo Festival. I'm collaborating with uh, Yoko Shimizu, who actually is the coordinator and organizer of the festival, as well as Elena um, Sadarakis, and she's an incredible person who runs the Biobat Art Space, a gallery in New York City. And together, we're bringing Space Art Project to a traditional tea house, which is the Tojo House. Uh, which is um, actually a national treasure of Japan. And so it's going to be a high futuristic showcase on tatami mats. So it's going to be really unusual and great. 
And then just to close, this is a little bit more information about Super Collider. Uh, so I run a small science art gallery space in Inglewood. And with this, we host bi-monthly exhibitions. There's actually several artists in here now who are uh, going to be a part of our exhibition opening November 10th. And uh, so really, this ignited with this mission to bring scientists and artists together. Uh, but we're expanding not only in our headquarters, which is called the mothership, uh, to then have satellite locations exhibiting our work. So some satellites include Art Space One in Korea, the Torrance Art Museum, uh, we're doing the Matsudo Festival, Biobat Art Space, and several other shows. So I need artists and scientists and collaborators to help me with this. So yeah, thank you. All right, so the next person we're going to hear from is David Lowe. Uh, he's a new acquaintance, uh, just arrived from the UK, escaping Brexit, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we have quite an interesting background here, so I'm quite intrigued and looking forward to hear him talk and introduce himself to us. After a degree in physics and philosophy from Oxford University, he got a PhD in aspects of thermoluminescent dosimetry from the Royal Naval College. And then he was two years a health physicist at the Cancer Research Institute, led to, which led to a career in theater, cinema, radio, television, working with people like circus, I hear in the background. <laughs> Working with people like Woody Allen, Neil Jordan, Costa Gavras, uh, I'm dying to hear more. Please introduce, warm welcome. Yeah. Okay, what do I click to? So you just, this, that's all you do. Okay. Just the okay. area for What I haven't got any, can you hear, does this work? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. What I haven't got any, um, haven't got any pictures of artworks, because when I think about it, I'm the artwork, so I'm, this is sort of happening, if you like, and it's a bit of a confession I wanted to give you this evening, so, you know, so I might blush even. Okay, so when I was at school, I had this idea of seeking and finding the truth, you know, it's probably because I wore thick glasses, had spots, and uh, had big Bugs Bunny teeth. So, and and what a, the sort of truth I was looking for, it wasn't the subjective truth of the arts that interested me. It was what I thought was the real objective truth of science. And this was at a time when physicists were, they seemed to be on the verge of, di of discovering the ultimate constituents of matter. You know, it was very exciting. They, you know, it was like pig in onion. You peel away one skin and you get another skin. You peel away that skin and you, peel that, and you also cry a lot because it <laughs> suffers. Anyway, things got complicated. They kept on banging particles together at greater and greater speeds and discovering more and more ultimate constituents of matter. And this is what we have so far. Ah, it works. Which, which looks to me like some sort of periodic table of elementary particles, which we don't quite understand yet. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's full of electrons, positrons, anti-bottom quarks, bosons, gluons, electron neutrinons, muon neutrinons, tau neutrinons, tarantinos. It, it's, um, for me, it's just a mess for the moment. We don't understand anything. And I think we got to this point because the, the, when they discovered a quark, they thought they discovered everything. But then they started discovering different types of quarks. And then they discovered all these little things. And it, um, so they thought they were going to find one thing. But in fact, they found uh, a pile of things. And I think, actually, they forgot that little poem of Jonathan Swift, which you all know. So, so naturalists observe, a flea has smaller fleas that on him prey, and these have smaller still to bite him, and so proceed ad infinitum. And we have a little thing that should be animated even. There's a flea, and that's the flea on top of the flea, and that's the flea on top of the flea, and there's another flea, and there's another flea, and there's another flea. And in fact, he goes down and down. Actually, if I do that quickly, maybe we're going to have an animation, no? Oops. Yeah, and that's cheating. So you got it? <laughs> we got it. No, that's the smallest one. So, so there was a Jonathan Swift who wrote that in 1773. And of, of course, it's not quite true, 
because when those fleas get quantum small, they start behaving strangely. They're everywhere and nowhere at the same time until they bite you, that is, which is counted as an observation according to the Copenhagen interpretation. <laughs> so, so I went off to Oxford University and soon realized that if I was going to find this truth, I'd have to add philosophy. So I took physics and philosophy. And Oxford is quite strange philosophy because the first year you ask questions uh, like you ask yourself, do tables exist? The second year, does God exist? The third year, do I exist? And then you finish off with uh, the sort of Wittgensteinian uh, linguistic philosophy where you realize that all your questions didn't mean anything. So you end up not knowing where you are, what you are, or who you are. So I might just as well have read Lewis Carroll's Hunting of the Snark, which is, <laughs> they sought it with thimbles, they sought it with care, they pursued it with forks and hope. They threatened its life with a railway share, they charmed it with smiles and soap. Now, oh, you're on the right one. So you get a first impression that it means something, then you realize it's nonsense, but there's a sort of sense in the nonsense. You should, all the researchers should read The Hunting of the Snark because it tells you all about what you're doing and what you shouldn't do. So then after this, after Oxford, I got into research doing a PhD in radiation dissymmetry because if you don't know what to do after your degree, you do a PhD. And, and there I learned a very important lesson. The lesson was it's not measuring that's difficult, it's knowing what you measure because there's so many people who measure things, but they actually don't, and it's getting even worse, actually, with big data, because there's so much data going around that nobody knows what it is anymore, and they expect the computer to analyze it and tell them what they, what they were looking for. So, so what I was actually doing there, in, in lay terms, it's like if you want to measure the, the level of water in a bucket, you put a ruler inside it. But when you put the ruler inside it, of course, you measure the level of the water with the ruler inside it. And it's much more complicated in radiation fields because um, you stick a Geiger counter into a mixed radiation field. And it's not very interesting to know the radiation level in a metal box inside a, well, inside a metal box. It's not very interesting. What interests us really is the radiation levels in a box full of skin, a box of skin full of bones and organs. And that's what I tried to do for my research thing. So with the PhD in hand, I got a job at the Cancer Research Institute in London, where in the presence of cancer patients, the difference between objective and subjective truth got a bit blurred, because the people were dying around me. And then things were also getting more complicated in my head, especially with you know, quantum mechanics, where objective truth seemed to have lost its meaning. Subjective and objective seemed to be mixed, because the mere observation of a phenomenon changes that phenomenon. And it's not just the, the, the poking with a stick observation, it's also passive observation. So something very strange is going on, and that's where I quote Feynman, who said, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, then you don't understand quantum mechanics. He also said physics is like sex. Sure, it may give some practical results, but that's not why we do it. And oh, that's a Geiger counter. And there's a picture of Feynman not having sex, <laughs> play, playing the bongos. But I'm, I'm sure the smile's the same. <laughs> he also said if he could explain his work to the average person, it wouldn't have been worth the Nobel Prize. But I could spend all the evening quoting Feynman. OK, so that's, that's one objectivity uh, destroyed by um, quantum mechanics. So remember, I was looking for some objective truth, absolute truth, etc. There's another subjectivity which is not always talked about. It's a, a sort of point of view subjectivity. Because we're limited in our possible conception of the universe. It's, as, it's almost as if we live in a walled garden. You know, if we could travel near the speed of light, or if we were very, very heavy, heavy enough to bend space-time, then maybe we could comprehend relativity. Because relativity is not at all intuitive. And in that sense, we can't, we can't understand it. You know, the calculations work and everything, but we can't understand it. We can't comprehend it. And in the same way, if we were very, very small, we could understand quantum mechanics. And there we are. We know what it would be like to be a particle and go through two slits at the same time. We, if we were very, very small, we'd, we'd know what it's like to be both a particle and a wave, a sort of LGBT at some very fundamental <laughs> level. Uh, by LGBT, I mean lepton, gluon, boson, tau, of course. <laughs> 
So that's another subjectivity. Another, another sort of... <laughs> another... Some, somebody walked in? No. <laughs> then there's the, there's the good old logical type of limitations to objectivity. Because our systems will always be incomplete or inconsistent. You know, we complain about being in a traffic jam, forgetting that we are part of the traffic jam. Which is, we live Russell's paradox. You know, does a set of old sets that don't contain themselves contain itself? And it always hurts my brain when I think about it. Does a set of old sets that don't contain themselves contain itself? And I'll actually show you a slide of Bertrand Russell. That's what I call the iconoclast smirk. <laughs> Don't what he told us, we are intrinsically, intrinsically part of something we are trying to extricate ourselves from in order to explain it. You know, that we meet up with this problem in artificial intelligence because we're, we're actually inside, but we want to get outside to explain the inside. But we're inside. You know, there's something very strange there. And I'm getting to another subjectivity. There's a sort of type of language subjectivity. As soon as we try to express something, we are being subjective. And I'm going to give you a very easy example, a very simple example, almost a stupid example, actually. An electron is an intrinsically negative. When we started calling electrons negative, it was almost a random choice made in the 18th century. I think it was something to do with Benjamin Franklin. And because we could have called the electron positive, and its opposite negative. And even now when you draw a circuit diagram, you generally draw a little arrow going from positive to negative, because we tend to think positive to negative from plus to minus. But electrons don't go that way. So negative is just a name, and a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. You know, an Englishman can't give a conference without quoting Shakespeare. But it's not as simple as that, because um, in negative, it's, uh, in a, it's got connotations, emotional connotations in everyday language. It, it's almost as if a negative electron was a little sadder or inferior to the positive proton. You know, happy-go-lucky proton and depressive electron. Well, neutral neutron just couldn't give a damn. <laughs> and to illustrate this... <laughs> so there were happy, happy proton, neutral neutron, and sad electron. And it's, it's not to scale, of course. <laughs> so... so so, uh, so in a sense, all understanding is subjective, because objective understanding should not be inherently limited. So what interests me, then is, this is the personal bit, is when subjectivity and objective, objectivity come together. You know, the, that tingling, that transcendental moment where everything falls into place. You know, we've got Wordsworth and his host of golden daffodils. We've got the end of Sibelius' Seventh Symphony, where it's also all builds up, builds up, builds up, and there's always, all of a sudden a magnificent release. There's, um, there's a moment when you can't turn your page over. There's the moment when the ball comes flying towards you. You lift up your hand almost instinctively. The ball lands in the hand. You close the hand instinctively. And it's there in your hand, you've caught the ball. You know, there's space, time, the laws of mechanics, and there's something else. And I wonder if that something else is art. And to illustrate the art, that's a picture of Johnny Bench. No, I don't know anything about baseball, but apparently Johnny Bench was the best catcher ever. And there I think he's demonstrating uh, the oxygen atom with baseball balls or something. <laughs> Anyway, I started to think about this, this tingle, you know. I'm sure you've felt it when, when something happens and everything seems, you know, it's like Zen and the art of archery or something, and everything falls into place. And I, it's, it's almost passing from a state of catching the ball, from not catching the ball to catching the ball, from, understand, from not understanding to understanding. And I always relate this to a particular moment in my physics career. I can vividly remember the, the couple of days I spent trying to understand Fourier transforms and uh, as applied to quantum mechanics. And there's the formula. So I can remember struggling. You know, I can remember the exact place of struggle. It was Three Cripply Road. It was a crappy little apartment just behind the railway station in Oxford. And I can remember the pain and frustration of the struggle, the fear and embarrassment of not succeeding before the, the next tutorial. And then the eureka moment and the emotion that came with it. And in fact, I, I now remember the emotion, but not the maths unfortunately. So my world was split into before, 
and after the state of not understanding and the state of understanding. I was released from the tragedy of not being able to comprehend the 300 years of this old maths that was invented 300 years ago was, was perfectly suited to the 20th century physics. Time dissolved. The potential trauma of not succeeding evaporated and my sudden emotional shift was a real catharsis in the classical sense. And this, for me, was a moment of science meeting art. Because I've written it all down there. My awareness was stimulated, my senses aroused, my capacity for perception increased, my scientific mind broadened, I was empowered. And this, this feeling, this tingle has never left me, and it's why I'm here today. So that's, that's so there's, I told myself there's a subjective truth and an objective truth, and maybe some other form of truth. I wondered, so I tried to find a word for it, hybrid truth, hybrid understanding, but just sounds ugly and incomplete. So instead of looking for an adjective to replace subjective or objective in my empirical Anglo-Saxon way, I just got rid of the adjective. So I don't call it objective truth or subjective truth, I just call it truth. Not subjective understanding or objective understanding, just understanding. So it's not science or art, just art, science. And that was the conclusion. Yes, we all search for that sweet spot in between. Thank you for that moving talk and what a great introduction. Um, Next person is Christian Kobrol, who luckily is uh, the husband of Donna Yalufka, and um, he's also uh, a scientist. He actually is a professor of impact research on planetary geology at the University of Vienna. And he is the director and CEO of the Natural History Museum in Vienna. Um, known best for his research on meteorite uh, impact craters and goes around the world. There's many photos of him in these huge craters. And um, I spent quite a bit of time in Vienna and more and more times we had dialogues and he got me quite excited about meteorites eventually. <laughs> I started really being obsessed. Um, so please give a warm welcome to Christian who agreed to give a short talk. <laughs> Well, thanks, Victor. Um, when, when you asked me just a few days ago that I would speak here, I asked back and said, what the hell should I talk about? You know? and, and she said, well, your research or the museum. And so what I decided is to talk about both, but briefly. You gave me five minutes, right? So let's try and start with uh, the, the science, right? So that, that's uh, me, yeah, as you can see. And <clears throat> what you see there, actually, are rock formations. And this is what kind of ties in with the Dana, who is speaking after me. And uh, uh, <clears throat> this is a location in Italy, um, which ties in with the music that you hear at the exhibit as well. Because what you see here is uh, rock successions. And you can see, if you look closely, that there are layers these rock successions. And just where I'm sitting there is um, basically my butt hits the place where the dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago. And uh, there is a label up there which says, this is the Gola del Bottacione, and they call it also informally the Gola del Iridio, the Iridium Gorge, because this location where you kind of see fairly well a separation between rocks is this is the rocks of the Cretaceous era, and these are the rocks that used to be called the Tertiary era, and more recently are called the Paleogene. Geologists have changed the names a little bit. <clears throat> and that separation between the two is called, or has been called, the Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary. Um, and it is particularly clearly visible here, not because this is how nature intended it to be, but because 
uh, hundreds and hundreds of geologists have been digging around there <laughs> and marking that particular uh, boundary especially well because this is the exact location where in uh, the late 1970s, colleagues from Berkeley University and from Italy have found evidence that there was a huge extraterrestrial impact with an object about 10 kilometers in diameter that collided with the Earth uh, at a location that was later found to be in Mexico, today is Mexico, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, and so created a crater called Chicxulub. It's about 200 kilometers in diameter. And the ejecta, the, the rocks basically, and the dust from that location were thrown worldwide. And it includes meteorite material and terrestrial material. The meteorite material um, is very rich in the element iridium, which is rare on the Earth, but very common in meteorites. And uh, so what these people from Berkeley found, together with our friend uh, Sandra Montanari, uh, who did the music that you hear in the show, um, which is basically the rocks, the, the succession of the rocks turned into music, you know, because you can scan these things and get various things like the uh, iron content and the carbonate content and a few other things. You assign notes to that and make music out of that. So that's what you kind of hear there. So you can turn rocks into music. But what the people from Berkeley found was that there was this huge anomaly in iridium in there uh, and other platinum group elements at a ratio that is 100,000 times more than you find in terrestrial rocks. So it was clear evidence that there was some extraterrestrial material in there. Later on, what researchers also found was not only there was this extraterrestrial component, but there were also uh, remnants of so-called shocked m minerals in there. So when a meteorite hits the ground at very high velocity, it basically a shock wave is generated in the ground and it alters the mineralogical structure of many minerals. And because this material was ejected worldwide, you find the impact happened in Mexico, but you basically find the ejecta all the way around, in Italy, in Spain, in New Zealand, in Svalbard, you know, wherever you go in the world, you find these ejecta. Uh, and so this was really evidence that a huge meteorite impact happened. Now let's go to something a little bit smaller, because meteorite impacts happen on the Earth, and this is what I have been researching for 35 years or something like that, um, is impact craters, and we know a couple of hundred on the Earth, and there's thousands and thousands on, say, the Moon. If you look at the Moon, it's all craters. On Earth, it's a little more difficult because the Earth changes all the time. The Earth has an active geological surface. There is plate tectonics, there's erosion, there is water interaction, all these things. So they rapidly obliterate meteorite craters and anything else, for that matter. For example, the Appalachians on the east coast of the United States 900 million years ago were as high as the Himalayas are today. Now they're basically gone because it's, the Earth grinds it all down, all gone. So we are constantly bombarded by extraterrestrial material. Every day, 100 tons of extraterrestrial material falls on the Earth, something that I guess Victoria is going to work on. And this is what brings us on the museum in Vienna that I happen to be heading, and I'm a particular expert on meteorites, so naturally I'm going to show you the meteorite hall of our museum, which shows the largest meteorite display in the world. In this particular hall here, uh, we show 1,100 meteorites. There's no museum in the world that shows more than that. Uh, for example, the Smithsonian in Washington shows about 130 meteorites. And we have things like gigantic iron meteorites, we have historical iron meteorites, historical stony meteorites. We have lunar rocks, we have Martian rocks, and things like that. So small meteorites fall, of course, more often than large ones, lucky for us, because the small ones, maybe it hits somebody on the head, but then only one person is damaged or dead. But if you have an impact, hundreds of thousands of people could die. And if you have an impact like Chicxulub today, I would say tens to hundreds of millions of people could perish. But fortunately, they only occur every maybe 50 to 100 million years. So the last one was 64 million years ago, 65 million years ago. You do the math. Uh, so these meteorites, what happens to them is they slow down in the atmosphere because of the air, the resistance of the air. They are being slowed down, and then they fall much more slowly, and we can find them, and we can look at them, and we can study them. 
And what do we learn from meteorites? There's two main things we have learned over the last decades from meteorites. The first one is something about the origin, age, and formation of the solar system and our Earth. It was actually somebody uh, from this university here, UCLA, who figured out uh, in the early mid-50s or something like that that you can use the age of meteorites to derive the age of the Earth because the Earth has been constantly changing, but meteorites didn't, and meteorites are the leftover of the material from which the planets, including the Earth, formed. So you look at, basically, it's like the forensic people that go through the trash heap and learn something about the murder that happened in the house. Yeah? This is what happened in the solar system. So how old is the solar system? How old are they, is the Earth? Which physical and chemical processes occurred early at that time. So that's what we learned from meteorites. The second thing that we've learned from meteorites, uh, that periodic table we just saw, or kind of, yeah, the real periodic table, which is the periodic table of the elements from hydrogen and helium and lithium and beryllium and boron and carbon and nitrogen. I think it looked actually not like the oxygen, but like the nitrogen atom, but anyway. So uh, yeah, all, these, all these chemical elements, how did they form? In the Big Bang, only hydrogen and helium formed. Where did the rest come from? We are composed of what? Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, sulfur, phosphorus, and so on. Where did that come from? Meteorites helped us to understand how chemical elements form in the interior of stars, in exploding stars, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go on much further. And my last slide, and third slide here is, oops, where is it? Mm -hmm. One more. Ta -ta. This is the place where wow. this nice hall is, and this is the, the, the museum that I happen to be director of. This is the Natural History Museum in Vienna. Um, the collections go back 270 years. We were founded in 1750. This building itself is about 130 years old. It was built as a museum building. We currently have about 30 million objects. I have a staff of 350 people, including 70 scientists, who do research from A for anthropology through C for zoology, uh, and everything in between in the geosciences and biological sciences. Uh, we publish about 250 peer-reviewed scientific publications per year, so we are a major research institution. And we have about a million visitors a year, which makes it one of the most visited museums in Austria. And with that, I think I've exceeded my five minutes, and I'm closing. Thank you. <laughs> We're always happy to rope people in like this. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, and I did ask him only two days ago, so you obviously speak often, which is not true of your partner, Donna, who's like, oh my god, I don't need to talk. Uh, <laughs> so I forced her once, and she did great, and she's going to do great again. Uh, she has been living in Vienna since the early 90s, so she is Viennese, but from Texas originally. Um, so, and she worked in the 80s with NASA. She's a graphic designer by background, but she experiments with a lot of media and painting, and uh, actually is currently in a show at the museum, uh, Natural History Museum, I was corrected, um, with the exhibition on the moon. And in fact, when I first met Donna, she was doing this huge, uh, long research and many paintings and uh, visuals around the moon. And now that we're 50 years uh, from the landing of the moon, and this year the Chinese actually got to the other side of the moon, it's quite an important exhibition that was just uh, started. So we see both sides of the moon. And she brings to us now the Milankovitch effect, which is an interesting kind of thing to bring to the attention now that climate change is a discussion and how everything is connected. So please welcome Donna, who will also take you to the exhibition if you haven't seen once we're done. Ooh, what's happening here? Just one second. Here we go. Donna, welcome. So you just do this. Okay, that was me, sorry. You're good, you're good. <laughs> Everybody's supportive. <laughs>
So I guess I don't need to give anybody a heads up that I'm a novice to this. Mm -hmm. So I'll mostly be reading. Um, the, Okay. Oh, what? How'd you do, Donna? Huh? <laughs> 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 maybe you're optimist, maybe you're just comfortable in your position. Well, that's, yeah. No, 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 no. That's, I'll just. <laughs> what we have here is um, the three paintings. The three you paintings, did. yes. And Donna actually brought her paintings in her suitcase because <laughs> we're low budget. <laughs> low budget. <laughs> and these three paintings are what? Tell us. Um. They're in the gallery. They're in the gallery. Okay. There they are. <laughs> okay. So, like I said, I'm going to be doing a lot of reading here, so bear with me. Um, Militin Milankovic is not a very common name and not a name that the general public would immediately associate with current climate research. I first became acquainted with the Milankovitch cycles from scientist and friend Alessandro Montanari, uh, an Italian geologist who has studied geological cycles over the past decade. I've asked him many times to explain in great detail, and he's a very detailed person, uh, how th this wobbly earth theory and the effects of these movements on the geological record. Um, I was fascinated, however, even now as, as an artist, uh, it's hard to comprehend the three factors that define these cycles, which are eccentricity, obliquity, and precession, and how such a subtle changes in the Earth's orbit and rotation could leave a well-defined record of climate differences in the Earth's stratigraphy. In recent years, my, er, my art has uh, wandered in the direction of science. Uh, mining science as a source for artistic material is not necessarily new. Um, the blending of scientific themes and imagery uh, with artistic interpretation, I think, provides an endless amount of uh, possibilities, creative possibilities for an artist to explore. Uh, an exhibit I had at the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis, YASA, many of you might have heard of YASA, uh, in Austria, um, I had a show, included artwork that mainly dealt with the Anthropocene. Another recent exhibit at the Osservatorio Geologico di Coldigioco fo focused on circles and cycles, another one of uh, my continuing themes. So interpreting Milankovitch was an obvious attraction for me. Uh, the three paintings in this exhibit have been animated to emphasize extremities, extremes of heat and cooling, heating and cooling, warm periods and ice ages coming and going all under the influence of Earth's rotation and its orbit, which the painting of the spheres represents. The second video shows a visualization of the values for procession, obliquity, and eccentricity as they've changed over the millennia. Professor Montanari has turned the succession of rock strata into music. And because this also captures the cyclicity of the geological record, I felt it was a good fit for my conceptual interpretation of Milankovitch. 
Unfortunately, this climatic cyclical dance has become a footnote to the human impact of these climate fluctuations. Milankovitch's cycles have explain, explained changes in Earth's climate over tens to hundreds of thousands of years, whereas human influence is exerted over much shorter time periods and threatens to dominate the natural cycles that have driven the Earth's climate over hundreds of millions of years. So, I'd like to thank everyone who made my exhibit possible. Many thanks to Victoria, thank you. And uh, for the invitation to exhibit my work at the Art Side Gallery. Thanks also to Caitlin Bryson and Andrew Ortiz for their logistical and technical support. I really appreciate it, thank you. And also with thanks to Seven Reasons Media in Vienna, Austria. And last but not least, Alessandro Montanari for the use of his rock music. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about it. That's about all I have to say. Thank you. Short and sweet, huh? Thank you. So thank you, Donna, for bringing us all together. And of course, the speakers. I always, um, I have to admit, and a lot of you that know me know that these things just happen. And I am totally open to who comes at what point, including asking Christian Cobra the last second. And every single time I'm amazed how there's a totally perfect connection. If you think about what we heard from Nina to the very end, it kept coming back to planet Earth and really us thinking about ourselves as looking out onto the earth for many complexities and also how to deal with complexity. And I really believe that it's about this. It's about coming together for artists and scientists. Yesterday, 11,000 scientists signed a letter saying that yes, there is a problem with our planet and we do need to act. And I ask what happens if 11,000 artists join those scientists? what would we do? It wouldn't be just a signed letter. It wouldn't be just a paper that was published. It would be something that would really reverberate. And I hope that we can do that. So let's go and hang out and talk and have some drinks. Thank you for coming. And thank you for watching. Thank you.